Hi, everybody, and welcome to day two. And um, in, in discussions as we're going through DAM, and we realize that there's a lot of people who maybe, how many people here already have a DAM? It's a lot of people. How many people are strictly responsible for metadata? Okay, so one of the things I think that people often forget about is, or not forget about, but they say, oh, well, what should we put in for the metadata? And what I have found uh, in my journeys over the years is that you don't necessarily have to start from scratch. So let's, let's go on that journey. Okay, and as uh, John introduced, we have with HBO, uh, there's uh, my colleague Laura Dawson is also here. Neither one of us knows anything about what's happening in the next episode of Game of Thrones <laughs> or the next one. <laughs> so don't ask. No spoilers. No spoilers, and we don't know them. So, okay, so as I said, you know, why, why start from scratch? There's a lot of great stuff already out there. So I wanted to share with you what I've done, um, what I've been doing with uh, my team at HBO, what I've done in the past when, in, other, in other jobs, and talk a little bit about our approach, the methodology, you know, what we use a little bit, but no, uh, no uh, vendor names. And um, also a little bit talk about taxonomy data governance. I'm also going to leave uh, some time for questions. And whoever asked the first question, I have good swag up here. I have a curb your enthusiasm, and our model over here. <laughs> curb your enthusiasm backpack for the first question. And let's make, so think about it, make it a good one. And if not, there's lots of other phone related swag up here. So, you know, keep in mind, like, uh, and uh, well, I'll go through this with regards to the dam, but I want to help you build a foundation as far as what, what you can do with existing metadata. So here's a little bit more about me. Um, so I, I have an MLIS degree, but uh, I really, I consider myself an information professional. Um, I have the Rosetta Stone up here. Actually, that could have been a good pop quiz question, but. Um, because that's what we really do. We translate from one thing to another to another, so this way then it helps save everybody time and money. <coughs> so, standard of standards. So why do you need a metadata standard? And I believe also these slides should end up being available at the app when they post them later on. So, um, anyway, so why do you need a metadata standard? And then there are questions about, you know, how are you going to implement the standard? Is it gonna just be in one system? Is it just in your dam? Are you gonna be receiving metadata from other systems? Are you gonna be sending it out? These are all the things that you have to keep in mind. You know, even if you don't have a dam, although most of the people here in the room already do, you know, what are the terms that you use now? So can you, do you have access to that terminology? Are there lists of values, pull downs or whatever? Also, what's your time frame for getting this? for developing your standard or figuring out what your metadata terminology is supposed to be. And also, coming from various worlds and experiences, what is there, does the metadata from your system have to go out to other places? So in my past life, I worked in book publishing, and so we had to have Onyx feeds that went out to the resellers. Here now, um, in, in this world, in the, in the media and entertainment world, we know that metadata that we capture ends up may be used for an IDR entertainment ID registry. It's gonna to have to go out again to resellers and to the distributors and the affiliates. So just keep all this in mind because as you make your list of questions that you're, as you're working on your project, these are the answers that need to be, these are questions that need answers. So this is the cool part of the job. Okay. The nice thing about standards is you have so many to choose from. And, what, and as we go through some of the uh, standards that I'll be talking about, you'll also find that they borrow from each other because they, like us, know that there's already some good stuff out there. And here we go. This is, this is off in our life. I have a, with, with the team, we're all sitting in a row and sometimes we're like, well, what, what, what about this term? And they're like, well, where does, wait, it's in here and it's in here and so, here we go, let's make a new standard, or somebody doesn't know and they come to us and go, we, we need to make a standard, and here we go again, and we end up with lots more standards. So the team, what we do is we vet the terminology across HBO, we're a centralized team, we don't own any data, but we make sure that the terminology that's used in the systems is consistent. 
We do our very, let me rephrase it, we do our very best <laughs> to make sure that the terminology we use is consistent because, um, and I don't really talk about that in here, but I will tell you it's a real cost saver. So this way if your developers and even your business people uh, have terms that they start with that are already vetted that you've documented, then you can save money because they don't have to spend any time and effort going out and doing that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So what are some good standards to start off with? So there's the, how many people here have heard of Dublin Core? Okay, good, that's a, a nice amount. Does anybody know where Dublin Core comes from? What it stands for? Dublin, Ohio. Dublin, Ohio is a group of librarians that got together and they came up with a set of, I think it was initially 12 and then now it's about 17 metadata terms. And they're, they're free text fields and they're loosely, so you can kind of interpret them a little bit how you wish, but it's a great starting point. And if you ever see DC colon, followed by a term name in another standard, it means that the source, the original, was from Dublin Core, so they refer back to it. Um, others, is the W3C also has quite a few standards in there, so I'm not gonna go through each and every standard that each organization has. This is really meant to give you a starting point in case you don't know about them, because depending on what, the, what you're doing, either in your company or what you're you know, from a product perspective or from a workflow perspective, you may need different standards that exist within, within each organization. And then there's also ISO has a lot in there as well. But these are, it's, it can be heavy reading, you know, like I wouldn't start reading it at 10, 10.30 at night. Um, <laughs> but, you know, get a good robust cup of coffee in the morning and get going and, and there's a tremendous amount that you can pull from there. So, coming from uh, having gotten the degree, um, that was one of the things that I learned more about was the Library of Congress standards because I wasn't as familiar with them because I came up through a different, a different career path. And so there's lots of different standards in there. They, in some ways, they're very much geared towards the work that the Library of Congress does, but what I like to do is end up, and, and, and what my team likes, is to make sure that we have a starting point for the vocabularies, then we can use those um, as the launch pad and see, does this work for us? Does it exist elsewhere? And I'm gonna go more into that with the methodology. Um, so the metadata authority description, the object description, and encoding and transmission for communicating back and forth. And a lot of these standards that they have in there, it's not just like a list. They, they also would have um, XML for this and some schemas. It really, so there's a lot of good information out there already. So you, again, you don't have to start from scratch. You can take something, you can edit it, and then put it into your system. Other, um, I'll go to some other ones. Let's see, library standards. Okay, so publishing. If you come from the publishing world, so BISIG, the Book Industry Study Group, they maintain the ONIC standard, which is used for the transmission, like to, um, you know, for, again, to the resellers. So one of the things that's interesting, I've been at HBO for three years, and before that, again, most of my career had been in publishing, and what I'm seeing now as a trend is that there's the broadcast and media industry, or media and entertainment, whatever you want to call us, um, that there are a lot of different standards organizations that exist in, the, in that space, but from a distribution standpoint, they're still, it's still evolving. There are definitely standards out there, but now the standards organizations are starting to come together a little bit more. So last week I was at a meeting for the digital supply chain, so there were people there from Movie Labs, from the Digital Entertainment Group, and from the EMA, which entertainment, I forgot what the MA stands for, but um, so again, talking a lot about you know how you describe the content, how you bundle stuff together, what's the identifier for it. So it's really very interesting just to see that, whereas a lot of these problems have already been solved but with BISIG and, by, and Onyx. So when I mentioned Onyx in the meeting, a lot of people didn't know what it was. So now you have an interesting way to kind of converge at least approaches and maybe some of the terminology. Here's the categories that they have, or here's terminology. Can we borrow anything? Is Amazon or some of the you know the other resellers, you know Barnes and Noble, whatever, do they? What are they taking for your broadcast and media content as well as your printed content? Is how different does it really need to be? Is the right hand talking to the left? So um, 
So the educational standards, there was the core standards in there because if you need to see if there was compliance. Um, and then also accessibility, which is something I think all of us need to keep in mind these days. And there's in blue, not so easy to read, I apologize for that. Um, so with regards to accessibility, what are the requirements? How many, like this is not accessible. The fact that I have this blue on the gray, on a blue gray, my son is, is a blue green colorblind, he would not be able to see this at all. So I'm usually pretty cognizant of that stuff. But anything you're doing, whether it's for your user interface in your dam, you do need to keep accessibility in mind. So there are standards out there. I have seen some really, and some of the suggestions that come up with the different apps, uh, you know, like, oh, we'll help you design your web page, you know, whatever, and the combinations are surreal from my perspective. So there's a place to go for there. One of the things, let's see, I think I point in the right direction. One of the things that we've been working on at HBO is a language metadata table, and Laura's speaking, I think at 3.10 today is gonna give a lot more detail, but I do wanna mention it, that this is something that we started as an industry, and has become an, uh, is in the process of becoming an industry standard. So Laura will give a lot more information about that. But one of the things I wanna encourage people to do is if you're starting to use these standards, check to see if they're active committees and try and get involved. It is a way to influence the standards that are out there. And um, so it's a way that maybe your voice is, is heard. So for me, like participating on, on BICIC committees, so the, the needs of Harlequin romances was very different from educational publishing. So we had to, you know, so you have to have a balance in there, but if you don't have a voice in it, then, then you're not heard. It's kind of like voting. And I will stop at that particular point. <laughs> So again, all those links are in there. But this is something where, um, this is a taxonomy tool that we use in-house, and I'll go into tools a little bit more, but we're able to capture the provenance of like all the different terms that were used across HBO. So some systems had Spanish, some people, you know, a lot of them had Spanish, uppercase, lowercase. We also found people were using SPA-LA for Latin American Spanish, SPAN, or was las dash. S-P-A-N for Latin American Spanish, L-A-S, Latin American Spanish. And so this way, that's how we started the Latin American. But again, Laura's gonna go into that. But from a tool perspective, having a taxonomy tool is extremely helpful in there. Um, also, this, the kind of information that we capture about a term within, within the team, so we wanna make sure we know what that descriptor is or what that term well, it's, there'll be a term name or in the case of rating, so that's the term, and then you could have G, PG, PG-13, et cetera, et cetera. Those would be you know, your pull downs or your list of values and how it's set up in your system can vary. But we make sure also that we capture our source information and what the authority is if it exists in the URL so that we can always go back and capture the provenance of what what we're doing, and so that is a really good practice. So I've kind of jumped ahead a little bit on the methodology. So what we do when we get started, so somebody comes to us and they say, well, we're, we're gonna stand up a brand new system. What metadata should we be putting in? And then we start asking questions. Where's the data coming from already? Um, what's your goal with the system? What, it, what kind of information are you doing? So we partner with the technical and the business project managers to make sure that the information is captured, you know, to get that overview, and then we'll work with them on the terminology. We often use a spreadsheet to get started because you can kind of stretch it any way you want. You can add as many tabs as you want, you can add as many columns as you want, and again, depending on what your tools are, you can also then massage the spreadsheet so this way if you want to ingest it into some kind of a system, you already have a good starting point for it. One of the things, and, and my team knows that I can be a pain about this, is I always put an overview sheet, <laughs> make them, make me put an overview sheet on my workbook that also says, this is for this project, here's the URL to the, you know, to the site that's tracking it, Here's the last time it was edited. Here's what each of the columns stand for. And we take the mystery away from it because otherwise you start looking you know, for Fred's project and then you find you have five spreadsheets in Google Docs, whatever, in the Google Drive for Fred's project. 
because um, every somebody copied it and then they made another one and they shared it with everybody and then which one is the definitive one? And we in taxonomy and metadata, we always want to be the definitive source. So that's our goal. Um, and then also, so these are all the things that I just said, you know, and, and you can also, again, adding as many columns as you need, and I have some examples, you want to map to as many, or see what the metadata standards are that you're trying to hit, what's your target, and how does what you currently have, it's if it's an existing system that's being updated, or a brand new one that, again, you're taking data feeds from some someplace else, you want to figure out where your sources are coming from. So this is an example of something we may have done. So the term name with the definition, the cardinality, um, what type of text is it? Um, from my experience, one of the really fun times I had at, at my last job was that we were doing payload transfers of the title. I was getting truncated in system C. So finally, we said, well, how many characters are you allowing? So the system A had 132 and system B had 120. So, you know, some people, if you're just working purely in the taxonomy world, you think you're only concerned about what the terms are and what those pull downs are. But you also have to really think a lot about the implementation. What does the developer need to implement? And so this way, if you capture that other stuff that we're expecting one or, or zero or more, you know, uh, of that particular term, then you start to give them the information so they know how to set it up. And this is again, so this is where we put in also what the system of record is and, and all that kind of information. So the more information you can capture up front, the better it is. And then depending on if you do have a taxonomy tool or some other kind of a, an, a, an application or whatever that is capturing your code, see if you can get comments in there that would also have that where you can retain it. I find it dangerous, again, just to leave everything in a spreadsheet because you don't know where that spreadsheet's gonna end up or if it's just gonna be on, on Ethel's laptop and, you know, and she went on vacation, so now they have to go back to the previous version. We've all been there. So, yeah, not fun stuff. All right, so once again, I know I'm like a broken record sometimes, but sometimes it's tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them, tell them again. So spreadsheets are a great place to start with. Sometimes if I have to sort things, I don't know what's gonna happen, I'll copy my tab, create a new sorted tab so I can not mess up anything. It depends on how I set up the spreadsheet. Um, and most people are pretty comfortable working with it. They know how to read it. Some people are really expecting numbers and, and it can confuse them. You may have to break it down. But at least for people, certainly the developers I've worked with and certainly with the uh, metadata and taxonomy people, the worksheet is, it, workbook is very comfortable. But the other thing is, is I do encourage the use of some kind of a taxonomy tool because it can hold a lot more. You can, um, spreadsheets are flat. With a, a taxonomy tool, you can work with, you know, from an ontological perspective and create the other relationships. And I think if I go back, whoops, that one. In here, where I did have to block it out, but like that shows what, in, in our equivalent terms. So TT, top term, BT, broad term, and then EQT is the equivalent term. Um, so this way we know what the term is, what the term is that's used in each system. And then over here on the left, we're able to indicate what that tag name is. Um, it's assigned a term ID by the system, which also the developers end up using. Um, and then we have the URN in there. So whenever possible, we resolve back to the URN uh, that exists out there in the big bad world. So again, we're not creating our own. We found out people were doing like the URN was HBO, blah, 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 but it was really something that existed out there. So now you have to like go back and clean stuff up as opposed to always resolving back to whatever's in the industry. Okay, so the cross mapping. So I've talked a lot about the spreadsheets and so the cross mapping is when you make all your different columns in this way then you can just relate the terms across. So if you have one system may have TTL for title, another one may have title, another one may have they may qualify the title. It may say, well, one of the terms that I don't like to use at HBO is show title. What's a show? We have series title, we have episode title, we might have documentary title, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
So if you tell me I have a show, how do I, then I have to start going back and do it. Or you have to start really thinking about how you use your metadata. Because if you have an identifier associated with that, then it can bring up all the other metadata that you may need. And then you know that it was a series and this is the episode. Here's the episode number. Here's the season number, et cetera, et cetera. So, and another one of my rules is one piece of metadata per field. Okay, because then you can mix and match and do whatever you want with it. But when you start glomming it all together, it gets kind of nasty. So, I'm just going to try and get here and leave some time for questions. Um, so, taxonomy governance, you want to, so we work on the terminology governance versus the data governance. So, we want to make sure people participate and we share the solution. I don't like to use the word recommendation, I use the word solution because we're, th and the team, we're three subject matter experts, we know our stuff. If the three of us agree on it, it's pretty good. So if we tell them that's our recommendation, somebody says, well, I don't like your recommendation, and they can just go now. I also um, send out, um, I think that's, I had that um, in the next, yeah, in the next one. So we document it, as I showed you, like in our taxonomy tool, we may also write a, a full paper on it. It might just be two or three or seven pages explaining the provenance, how we got there, the who, what, when, why, how. Uh, and we also make sure we get sign off. Because this way, even if people have left the company, but we knew that they were also subject matter experts or business people that had been there a long time, that they signed off means that it was vetted. And again, I don't have to go back you know, to the wheel and just say, let's start this all over again. But I also put in, when I sent out the email asking for acceptance, um, silence equals acceptance if they choose not to. <laughs> I give usually a week. So. So that's the whole write it down. You have your provenance. You have built your case. A spreadsheet is good for starters. Taxonomy tool better. Or, and if you can have both, because sometimes you have to push out some kind of report that uh, people can handle. We also you know, can send out APIs or schemas. And make sure you're in. And so one of the other things is think about who your audiences are for this terminology. So there might be the archives group. It might be analytics. Uh, might be the subject matter experts or marketing or whoever. And then there's all different kinds of audiences, internal, public facing, and then those who are actually responsible for the data quality. 